Live from San Francisco, it's The Cube. Covering Red Hat Summit 2018. Brought to you by Red Hat. Okay, welcome back everyone. We heard live, this is theCUBE here in San Francisco live for Red Hat Summit 2018. I'm John Furrier, the host of theCUBE. Our next three guests is Delisa Alexander, Executive Vice President, Chief People Officer at Red Hat. Welcome to theCUBE. Zoe Degay, who's the, get that right? Is that? Zoe, yeah. Zoe, mm -hmm. okay. Winner of the Open Source Academic Award from Duke University. Go Blue Devils. Yes. <laughs> okay, mm -hmm. and, and we have um, Dana Lewis, winner of Open AP with Open APS, which stands for? The Open Source Artificial Pancreas System. Artificial Open Source Pancreas System, great stuff. So congratulations, you guys are all award winners. Before we get into some of the questions, love your applications, talk about the program. What is this about? What's the awards program here at Red Hat Summit and why are these guys here? So as Red Hat, we believe is the open source leader, we have a responsibility to promote uh, women in technology and particularly women in open source. And so one of the things we thought we could do is to create an award that really spotlights the contributions women are making in open source to inspire future generations to consider being open source developers or contributors. Congratulations, love that you're doing that, it's been fantastic. We'll start with the, the young student gun here. You got what's your degree, first of all? What are you studying? So I'm studying biomedical engineering and computer science. Tough major, huh? Yeah. <laughs> easy. Tough. It's like, it's such an easy uh, question. Easy, but first I've been question is how are you doing years, the blockchain so. impact? It's funny, Jim White here has asked that question on day one. No, in all serious, tell about what your application is. This is super yeah. important. Yeah, so I'm basically working on research and creating a tracking system for vaccines that enter into developing countries. So through that, you're able to understand uh, how exactly do vaccines travel through these countries, as well as where does the system break. And if you can pinpoint that, you can actually solve the problem. And how did you get the idea? How did this all come together? Yeah, so um, I was in a research course at Duke, um, which has collaboration with the university in Uganda. And we actually got to travel to Uganda and interview various stakeholders, pharmaceutical companies, health system, and understand how does the, we wanted to be in vaccines, yep. but we didn't know what exactly to do. And so after interviewing, um, I kind of came up with the idea of why don't we actually put a tracker on these devices that gives off the GPS location and the temperature so we can actually understand the entire system. It's good to get so. that ground truth too and mm -hmm. get into the local areas. The, yeah. the big walk away was what, vaccines, this is important to track it from the origination to destination and making sure it all kind of matches yeah, up? Making sure, first of all, you don't have any data on exactly where they're going because this box is just carried by hand. And um, the pharmaceutical companies, once they ship the vaccines into Uganda, after that, they don't provide any data on what's going on. So that data is also important and it's also, you want to know when does the system break? Because often in the last end, when the vaccines are actually administered, they've already gone out of their cold chain cycle and so they don't, they don't work anymore. So, That's a great story. Yeah. Dan, how about your, your story? This is a good one. This is a real practical one for people with diabetes. Talk about, show the, first of all, show the product, because it's always good to yeah. do a little live uh, prop there. So, yeah, okay, there it is. So what is that? So this is an open source hardware board. It's actually got an Intel Edison on the backside, but what this does is it talks to my insulin pump and my continuous glucose monitor, brings the data together, runs it through an algorithm, and sends commands back to the insulin pump to tell it what to do. So this is what we call a closed loop system where we have the computer doing the math instead of the human with diabetes doing the math several times throughout the day. And does it do the auto injections as well so it kind of feeds the glucose levels as well, so it's data. Right, so the insulin pump is automatically dosing the insulin and we also have a continuous feed of the blood sugar every five minutes as well. And that's what you mean by closed loop. Exactly. And like, uh, for people who have these monitors, they have remote statistics, does it talk to a device? as well in the mobile device, how does that work? Yeah, so I can glance down at my watch and see how I'm doing on my phone, my loved ones, wherever they are, can see you know, how things are going, so if they need to intervene, they're able to do that remotely. So it really provides peace of mind, as well as a lot better outcomes for those of us living with type one diabetes. And what was the motivation here for to get involved deeply in this project? It was really selfish. I wanted to sleep and I couldn't hear my CGM alarm, my glucose alarm. And so my project actually started of just get the data off to make a louder alarm. And then we built an algorithm that allowed us to look into the future and do proactive alarms. And then we worked with other people to actually communicate with the insulin pump. And that's how we progressed to closing the loop. And because I had been helped so much by other people in open source, it was a no brainer to also make our work open source. And so you open source everything. So you so any, what other progress have you can you share? I mean, you have predictive analytics that tell you that, okay, I'm going to go for a hike soon. So therefore, I'm going to do this and all kinds of cool data gathering. Does that play into it? Is it a Absolutely. lifestyle? And so it's like a Fitbit meets 
you know, <laughs> closed loop. It's more like taking you know standard medical devices and boosting their capacities with the help of computing technology. It's not fancy machine learning. It's the same math a person with diabetes would do. But the benefit is it's automated to go every five minutes, and it doesn't fall asleep. It doesn't get lazy. It doesn't round up or very down. It's going to be giving really precise increments so that when your situation changes, you skip a meal that you thought you were going to eat. You're going to go hiking. For whatever reason, if you're going up or down more than expected, it can react instantaneously and much better than a human can. That's fantastic. I'm so glad you're doing that too. How does someone get involved uh, with this project? Obviously it's open source software, but you have devices. Is it in market? Is there? So this is an open source project because we are not a company, so we cannot distribute medical devices. That's frowned upon by the FDA. Yeah. <laughs> and so this is an open source DIY project for people who want to get involved either to help with the project or to build one themselves, they can go to openaps.org. We've written a plain language reference design to help anybody, whether you're a person with diabetes, a loved one, healthcare provider, a researcher or a developer, understand how the system works. And then that leads you to the documentation of how to build one as well as to the code where anybody can get involved. So that's the loophole, to, get it, to <laughs> say it plainly, get around the whole being a company. You build your own. Yes. Yeah. So that's the way, that's your, yeah. okay, great, congratulations. So where's this all going? This is fantastic story. How many other people are involved in the program that you have? Well, share more about how people can get involved too. Yeah, this is our, this is our fourth year um, of having the program and we're really you know, just thrilled with the quality of the of nominations. We had over 100 nominations. Our judges then narrowed the field down to 10 and then the community selected the winners. So. Um, we don't really see an end to this. We just see the community adding and growing organically. So one thing we did this time is we introduced our winners to our collab students. And so now they're creating a network and that network density is just increasing and improving and I think getting stronger. It's really amazing. And one thing I always love about open source, you guys have been a benefit of it obviously, winning and succeeding, is that democratization and community yep. are coming together at a whole nother level. And I think what's interesting about the projects that you guys have is you got you know, good, good things happening with tech, so it's, it's tech for good, mm -hmm. but since Obama put the Jobs Act in, we can fund these projects now as entrepreneurial ventures yep. and be mission driven off, well, you don't have to do a non, a non a for nonprofit. So we're seeing a huge growth in entrepreneurial activity around tech for good on projects that would never would have got funded before. So you're seeing a whole nother generation of great tools and technology saying, hey, let's solve a problem. Yeah, and I think that's one of the things I love about us both being in healthcare is it really shows that there's amazing applications we can take this technology and apply it in healthcare and do in different ways. And it doesn't have to be a company right away. It doesn't have to be either a for-profit or a non-for-profit. Yeah. There's a lot of ways open source is bringing people together to solve yeah. the very problems we need to be solving. You feel good that you built something great like that and again, now you got people using the software. What's the feeling like? Oh, it's just incredibly rewarding. I mean, myself, I just have the peace of mind to be able to go to sleep at night. That yeah. is a priceless feeling, but when I hear other people using it, yeah. they, they build the project for different reasons. Some, they want to be able to remotely monitor their loved ones. Others are doing it for their children so that they have better out health outcomes. But there's just these amazing stories outpouring from the community. And to me, that's the beauty of open source is you can really apply it however you need to apply it to your lifestyle. Wait, where can someone get involved in your project? Is there like a GitHub repository? Is there yeah. a site? Everything's on GitHub for us, but I would go to openaps.org first. It links to the documentation and the code where people Open can connect. Openaps.org. That's right. Okay, great. How about your project? What's uh, yeah, How do people so, get involved with what uh, you're doing? Ours is on GitHub right now, and um, so you can get involved through there, but I guess we're kind of right now developing in the back end stages, so soon we'll be at that stage where you can contribute more. Um, and right now we've been, just been using other open source libraries and kind of contributing in that way. But actually we talked earlier yeah. about how do you get involved in open source. And especially being a student, um, I kind of fell into coding because of open source in a sense. Um, where, um, yeah, yeah, project? yeah. So coming into college, I wanted to apply the engineering concepts I was learning in the classroom. And uh, I got involved in a lot of entrepreneurship on campus. And through that, I was asked to make a front-end interface, and I didn't really know how to go about doing that. So then um, I found an open source library, stumbling around, that was doing a similar thing. And that's how I kind of taught myself, and then from there, I branched out and learned more and more. And I think for any budding student, um, budding entrepreneur, um, open source is a great way to take your ideas further. And my interest is in healthcare, so that's where I went. But anyone could have an idea, oh, I want to start this business in this way. And they might not think that open source is a way to go about doing that, but it is a great way to learn it's more. It's a good way to change a lot of things, not just yeah. career or projects. Yeah. There's a non-linear progression of learning happening. You yes. can come in, you're stumbling around, quote, learning. Yeah. It's yeah. not like 
you know, chapter one course, online course, go to chapter right, two. Right, that is true. You know, there's a YouTube, there's a stuff on GitHub, open source, right. there's people involved, so this is a new, this points it's, to a whole new generational shift. It is. Of learning, connecting. It's yeah, so exciting it. because she's the role model we're talking about. We <laughs> want girls to see that you can become a coder okay. You know, later, you don't have to necessarily Wait, start. Really, she's school. 14. She's coding in she, Unity. Yeah. I told a soliloquy. Great, do some smart contracts <laughs> and get in the blockchain <laughs> action. You know, blockchain is the future. Get a Bitcoin and blockchain. Ethereum. It's yeah. cool stuff. Congratulations. Thanks for Thank doing very this. Much. Very inspirational. And thanks for sharing the story in theCUBE and keep in touch. Yeah. Thanks for coming. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Thanks for great having women us. in tech, great leaders, doing some great stuff. Award winners, celebrities here on theCUBE. <laughs> I'm John Furrier. We'll be back with more live coverage after this short break. <laughs>